your Bibles and go to Titus tonight. <clears throat> Frog in the throat. <clears throat> Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. Tonight, my message I'm going to preach, there's a, there's a very important lesson that I want you all to get, but um, a lot of what I'm preaching tonight uh, was kind of inspired by many conversations that took place uh, last week when I was at the Post-Trib Prophecy Conference in Arizona, and I was just, uh, I was blown away at just some of the testimonies I was getting with people, some of the things that they're having to put up with in their churches, and, um, you know, I, want, I thought, you know, I need to preach a message to try to be a blessing to these people. But at the same time, you know, there's some great lessons in here for you that I want you to get to. I want the people in our church to understand this because I don't ever want to become what I'm going to be talking about tonight. And so uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 5, I want to read this passage and I'll tell you what I'm preaching about tonight. But it says, For this cause left I thee in Crete that thou shouldst set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. So it's given the qualifications for elders that Paul is wanting Titus to ordain in every city that he goes to. And so he gives all these qualifications and he says one of the things he's supposed to be able to do, he's supposed to be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince gainsayers. Something a pastor ought to be able to do is he ought to be able to not only handle a little bit of opposition, but he ought to be able to change the minds of the opposition. And it's amazing how many pastors today, they can't handle anyone in their church thinking any differently than them on anything. And what do they want to do when somebody comes along who thinks a little different? They want to figure out how they can run them out of the church. And one of the things that we're supposed to be able to do is to exhort and convince them, gainsayers. We're supposed to be able to try to change people's minds. Okay? And that, that is one of our jobs. That's what we do when we're out souling. We're trying to change people's minds. We're trying to, especially in this area, what we're trying to do, we're trying to get people to quit trusting in their works for salvation and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're trying to change their mind. That's what we do. That's what a soul winner does. That's what a preacher does. And so a pastor is supposed to be able to do that, to change people's minds, to actually change their minds. It doesn't say he's supposed to bully them and intimidate them into submission on certain subjects. Okay, That's not what it says to do. It says you're supposed to exhort and convince the gainsayers. It's my job, one of my jobs is I'm supposed to preach sound doctrine, but I'm supposed to do it in a way where you all get it and where you all understand it and you are convinced 100% that these things are true. And so verse 10, we'll keep reading. It says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. There's a lot of people who come along, especially Jews is who he's talking about, who they're just preaching things for filthy lucre. They want the money. They're in it for all the wrong things. He says these people's mouths need to be stopped. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. I wish I could spend some time on that verse right there, but uh, that's, that's an interesting verse. I need to preach a message on that verse one of these days. It says, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. So we see one of the main jobs of the pastor, exhort and convince gainsayers. A pastor, we see uh, when, um, when Paul was given the qualifications in Tim to Timothy, he said, not a novice. Okay, It's not supposed to be somebody who you know, hardly knows the scriptures. Otherwise, he's going to get lifted up with pride. He's going to get himself in trouble. But you know, we ought to be skilled in the word of God. That's one of the reasons a pastor is worthy of double honor because he labors in the word. He works. He puts some effort into his study. He puts some time into it. And you know, and it's amazing how many pastors are out there today too that are preaching messages that they just, I mean, 
literally they download the outlines off the internet. You can buy books out there. I've got one in my office. I don't even know how I got it, but it's just all sermon outlines from the book of Proverbs. Somebody else did. You know, I'm sure the outlines are fine, but you know, why don't I just make my own? Well, that would require I do some study. But, you know, I think that would help quite a bit because a lot of guys are just regurgitating stuff that they got from some textbook somewhere when it comes to a lot of things. And we should, we ought to, we ought to study. But, you know, sadly, the typical Bible college today is sending men out to be pastors that are practically scripturally illiterate. They do not know their way through the Bible. They don't know anything about Bible doctrine. And they for sure don't know how to handle opposition. They don't know how to change people's minds. And instead of, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, they use intimidation in full-fledged mafia style. And what I want to talk about tonight is how to handle the pre-trib mafia. Okay, Now, you all heard me talk about the pre-trib mafia. But listen, I, I, did, I heard a lot of testimonies last week when I was in Arizona, just people... And, uh, and eventually you're going to be able to see these too. I did a couple of interviews with pastors that, I mean, they have dealt with some real tough stuff from the pre-trib mafia because these guys had a different position on end times. I mean, these men were just treated like garbage. Their ministries were taken away from them and just, they were just treated like absolute heretics because they didn't agree with the pre-trib doctrine. And these pastors, too, that took away their ministries, they didn't even attempt to sit down and go through the scriptures with them. They didn't even try to change these guys' minds. They just full mafia style pretty much put the hit on them, you know, for lack of a better term. And, we, and I talked to church members that had the same thing, people that were thrown out of their churches because they didn't line up with end times beliefs, you know, the end times beliefs of the church. And listen, if you don't believe everything the way I teach about end times, you know what? We're not going to throw you out of the church, okay? I, I promise, if you are pre-trib, if you're still pre-trib after all the preaching I've heard, I'm going to feel bad because I'm not doing a very good job teaching it. But at the same time, you don't throw somebody out of the church over that. Okay? That's, that's not going to happen. We're not going to throw you out of the church if you disagree on that issue. But people are doing it. Good people. I mean, good families. Soul winners, they're getting thrown out of their churches. And it makes me mad. And maybe I shouldn't get mad because a lot of these people want to come over to our church. And they all, eventually, you know, we're, I think we're going to be benefiting from that. But at the same time, that shouldn't happen. People shouldn't have to drive an hour and a half and two hours to our church. That shouldn't have to happen. They got churches in their own area. These pastors, they ought to be able to handle it. They ought to be, you know, they, they ought to be able to figure out the truth. But even if they don't figure out the truth, you know, this mafia style of handling people, I think, is ridiculous. And, you know, what is the you know, mafia? Well, the definition of mafia is a hierarchically, I can't even say that word, structured secret organization allegedly engaged in smuggling, racketeering, trafficking, and narcotics and other criminal activities in the U.S., Italy, and elsewhere. But then another definition says any small, powerful, or influential group in an organization or field. And in the fundamental Baptist world, there is a pre-trib mafia. And just like, too, when it comes to the mafia, you know, is the mafia real? Well, no, you know, people who are in the mafia, they don't admit they're in the mafia. You're not supposed to know that the mafia is there, okay? But yet, at the same time, everybody knows the mafia is real. Everybody knows, you know, that, uh, you know, in Chicago, you know Chicago's got the mafia in Chicago, all right? And you know that... Uh, Emmanuel is probably a part of it in some way, or at least, you know, being influenced by those people. You know, we all know the mafia is real. It's not just a conspiracy thing. All right. It's real. They've been around for a long time and it's in Baptist churches too. And when it comes to the pre-trib doctrine, Baptist preachers, they go full mafia style on other preachers, on missionaries, and even on church members. And it's a joke. It's a joke. So the pre-trib mafia, it's an organization that supposedly does not exist, you know, that is meant to keep preachers in line and force them into a pre-trib Zionist position. And they will use any means necessary to get you to believe in the foolishness of those doctrines, including intimidation, humiliation, and even shunning, if that's what it takes. And listen, 
I'm putting myself in danger preaching a message like this, all right? If you find out, you know, I died and committed suicide, you know, don't, don't believe it. You know, don't believe that note, all right? It was forged. I didn't do it. But, let's, you know, it's like, why are you preaching something like this? Because I'm dead meat anyway, all right? I preach at the post-trib conference in Arizona, and so, you know, I'm already dead meat with that group. I, I've ceased to exist, all right, in their minds. So I, I've, I've got nothing to worry about. But the pre-trib mafia, ultimately what they use, they use the way of Balaam as a way to keep people in line. And what the way of Balaam is, the way they got Balaam, they tried to get Balaam to do what they wanted him to do, they use promotion and money. And that's what they do in the pre-trib mafia world. Okay, they will amongst preachers. Okay, if you will stay in line, if you will do what they want you to do, you can get promoted. You can get asked to speak at these meetings, especially if you can take out the opposition. If you can take out one of the other guys, you know, like me, if one of them could take me out, you know, that would help get them a promoter. Or if they could take out Pastor Anderson, man, they're going to get skyrocketed, you know, to the top of the food chain there. If they could, if they could do that. But it's it, it's they're offering promotion, money. Okay, look at how you know missionaries. Missionaries, unfortunately, we will ne- never be able to depend on them to take a strong stand in anything because they are financially dependent under these organizations, under these mission boards, and these guys they can't they can't preach the truth on these things. And listen, I, I love missionaries. There's a lot of missionaries I know, but I feel sorry for the missionaries who have made the mistake in the past of making friends with me because it's like now they're all scared. Now they're all nervous. I've got friends of mine, people who have publicly been my friend, and they have got the mafia treatment. They've gotten the phone calls trying to find out if these people are on my side intimidating these people. One good friend of mine, I don't know who it was. I, ne- I he never, They never told me who it was that called him, but he got a phone call from somebody wanting to make sure he hadn't changed from being pre-trib because if he did, they were going to break fellowship from him. Well, man, what's one of the first things he does, he goes on his website. And if you go on their website, on the main page, they've got a whole tab on there saying rapture and showing that they're a pre-trib rapture church. And they never did that until he got confronted by the pre-trib mafia. And then he put a bunch of sermons promoting preacher. Well, that's fine. If that's what he believes, that's what he ought to preach. But at the same time, it's like the pre-trib mafia scared him. Okay, there's some other missionaries we know. On, when my wife's on Twitter, this one guy, it's like every time he tweets something at my wife, you know, he's got to mention how, now I don't agree with your end times doctor. He's always got to throw the disclaimer on there. She finally called him out for us, like, you know, enough with the disclaimers, all right? But it's like these missionaries, if they're going to talk to us, they got to make sure the pre-trib mafia knows, hey, you know, I'm friends with these people, but I'm still pre-trib. I'm still pre-trib, you know, don't yank my support. Don't take away my ministry. They're scared to death of these people. And listen, if you like us, why can't you just get along with us and not put the disclaimers on there? You know, people that I'm friends with, whenever I talk to them, hey, you know, I love you, even though I don't agree with your position on this. You know, even though I don't like that, you know, I don't like this about you. Why do they, but why do they always do that with us with the end times doctrine? They'll line up with us on salvation and the things that are really important, but they always got to throw that disclaimer in there because they're terrified of the pre-trib mafia because it's real. And listen, this, this is wrong. This is not the way that things should be. And they are, they're, so they're being, they're being forced into it. They're not even allowed to look into anything. You know, they're scared to study it. They're scared to find out anything because they know they will lose their ministries. They know that the preachers will be talking bad about them. They know that they will get used as the bad illustrations. And so they're intimidated. But listen, where do we see in the Bible we use intimidation to win people over on anything? We don't see that anywhere. You know, Baptists, we're always been the one that have been known for standing for religious freedom. We've never believed in using government to force what we believe on other people. We've always believed it's between them and God. We believe in the priesthood of the believer. Baptists have always stood for that. Yet when it comes to these end times doctrine, we've got this organization out there, this criminal organization that's got a lot of money behind it that's advancing this and forcing people into that pre-trib position. And listen, the pre-trib mafia does exist. And preachers and church members, they're often shocked by the consequences of of getting away from the pre-trib doctrine. Listen, I learned this myself. Other preachers I talked to, whenever they started learning the truth about end times, they didn't think it was going to be a big deal. 
They didn't think it was the most important doctrine in the world. They always knew the pre-trib wasn't that clear. And when they saw how clear the post-trib doctrine was, they're like, you know, I'm, I'm going to take the Bible and I'm going to show them what it says. And they're going to come over to my side. And then they went and like, man, listen, hey, listen, I learned. I got all this Bible all excited. Listen, I was there too. I mean, you, imagine my disappointment, you know, when I'm, I'm showing these preachers, man, look at how clear that is. You know, it says after the tribulation in those days, it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, you know, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. That man of sin be revealed. You know, I'm thinking this is so clear. You know, anybody can see this. And then not only do they not see it, but then you get a nasty rebuke. You get called names and they don't even use any scripture. They don't exhort and convince the gainsayer. They go into full mafia style mode. And many preachers and church members, they've mistakenly believed that line when preachers say, show me where I'm wrong from the Bible and I'll change. They heard that all their life. And then you show them from the Bible and what do they do? They go nuts on you. And you know, there's a high, there, so the preacher mafia is real. There's a hierarchy in it. And many preach, me, preachers and church members, you know, they were mis, they've been mistakenly convinced or falsely convinced that their church was independent. They thought they were an independent Baptist church. But listen, when it comes to this doctrine, you find out if you're independent or not. And most of these churches, they are not independent. These missionaries that are out there, they're not independent Baptists. Not one bit. These evangelists. We can't depend on them either. They're dependent on financial support. They're dependent on getting these meetings and they're not going to get them if they change on this doctrine. And I keep getting shocked at people that I know that I'm finding out are post-trip and that are not that, that believe replacement theology, but they've never been public about it. People that are pretty well known, but they just never been public about it because they know I'm done for if people find out. And I think that's a shame. I would actually prefer if people are going to be that scared, they not be on our side. I say let the pre-trivers have all the wimps. That's the way, that's the way I look at it. But, you know, the, the many pastors, they thought they were free to preach what they had been convinced of from the Scriptures. In their own churches, you know, I can preach this, and, you know, it's my church. You know, the Bible's the final authority. And they find out different. Church members, they thought that their pastor was the pastor of their church. They didn't know that there was a fundamental pope out there that was telling that pastor what to do and that was pulling his strings. They didn't know about those popes. You know, and the structure of the pre-trip, there, there is a structure. So the, the structure of the mafia, all right, and I don't have time to read through all of this, but in the mafia, I was, I was looking up online, they've got an actual, uh, you know, hierarchy and structure. And so the people on the bottom in the mafia, they're what's known as associates, all right? This is like the church members, okay? The ch and with associates, you need a lot of them, all right? And we need big churches. Why? Because we need the money. We got to have the money coming in. We got to have the big missions money because the more we've, money we've got for missions, the more say we have amongst these missionaries and what they do. And so they do. The, the associates, they're the ones that are given all the money, giving the preachers all the power, making them look good. And then above the associates, you have the soldiers. That's what they're known as, the mafia. And these are the guys that are out there doing the work, dirty work, the ones you see on TV shooting the places up and all that kind of thing. And that, that's what we would call, I would say, like the, you know, some of these Internet trolls that are out there that are always trying to intimidate and shut, shut up the guys like me. You know, these are the sluters and some of those people out there that's out there putting junk on the internet, just trying to refute things, hoping they're going to get promoted. Hoping, you know, if I, if I can shut some of these people up, if I can get them quiet, then I'm going to get lifted up. I'm going to get promoted. And they're the ones that do all the dirty work. And I've seen this. I have seen this even in areas where the fundamental Baptists were correct, where they would, you know, one of the popes found out about some guy spreading some false doctrine and they never go online and publicly rebuke that guy because if they make themselves look stupid, the consequences are too great. I'm one of the popes. I can't fall. So what do they do? They have all their underlings go and let's bombard these people with negative comments. You know, you guys all go and straighten them out and none of them ever do it. 
None of them put themselves out there. They don't, they're not out there putting their messages online, refuting these things. What do they do? They send their little expendable soldiers, their pawns. Okay. They send them out there and they'll willingly do that. And then above the, uh, above the soldiers, they have the, uh, capo regimes is what they're called. And these are the people, they're kind of the heads of different organizations. All right. And so these would be like the big name preachers. These are the preachers that are the heads of the Bible colleges that are training all the soldiers to go out and make sure you all keep everybody in line on these doctrines. And so there's always people, they're always wanting to get moved up there. They want to be ahead of an organization. They want to have a bunch of preachers that follow them. Okay. Sam Gipp recently, he was trying to get promoted to couple regime and uh, he, they had that big conference. You know, Brother Gomez, he couldn't just preach the stuff himself. He couldn't just have the conference himself where he preached and refuted all the things that Pastor Anderson teaches. No, what's he do? You know, he brings in a thug. If you can take this guy down, you know, you're going to get promoted. You're going to get lifted up. So he comes in there, man, he's all ready to go. Because listen, most preachers too, most preachers are afraid to try to refute this stuff. They can't do it. But these dispensational Ruckmanites, they've been trying to get in with the mainstream Baptists for a long time, but everybody's been repulsed by them because their doctrine is so bad. Okay, I say it all the time. The Ruckmanites are the village idiots of the pre-trib world. But they're the only ones dumb enough to try to go after what we teach. And so what do they do? You know, they get Sam Gipp in there. But unfortunately, you know, Sam Gipp's a loose cannon. He started preaching that Jesus wasn't supposed to be called Jesus. You know, Jesus isn't my Messiah. You know, there's three gospels. He's teaching all these things, completely exposed himself, made himself look like an idiot, and actually really helped our side out a ton. I mean, that meeting was one of the best things that ever happened to our cause. It was a, it was a great thing. You know, he is now this great illustration of a heretic and one you shouldn't follow. And now, I mean, most of the mainstream Baptists, they have backed off a lot of this stuff. Now they're not done. Okay. I've still got connections in the mafia and they're, they're not done. All right. You know, round two's coming. They're, they're waiting. I think they're waiting to see what happens with this post-trib conference and seeing how they're going to refute things. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. But unfortunately, Sam Gipp did not get his promotion. Instead, he got a whole bunch of ulcers and he's having all kinds of health problems and he's out for like two months right now. Uh, and so, uh, you know, he, you know, he's, and he, he was done for anyway. All right. You know, even if he croaks, he was already done for. He completely exposed himself. But then after you go get above the couple regimes and stuff, the levels that it gets to up there, you know, you've got like the underboss, you know, the boss, and then on top is the godfather, you know? And so it's like, you know, who are these people? Okay. Well, I'm just going to tell you right now, I don't know for sure. I never got high enough up the or I never got above soldier. All right. So uh, I was, when I was in the pre-trib mafia, I would, I never got above soldier. I wasn't a good soldier because one of the things that soldiers are supposed to do is they're supposed to be kissing the rear of the capo regime up, up above them. And I was always bad at that. I was just never into, you know, doing that. It just, I don't know. I, I wasn't loyal enough. And so I don't know either. You have to get up to the higher ranks to even know who, because we never know who the head of the mafia is. You, know, you never really know who they are. And so I don't know if these are real people or if after it gets above the capo regimes, now we're talking about principalities and powers. You know, who's the godfather? Satan himself. You know, I, I, or, or the antichrist. Or maybe he's the boss. I, I don't know. You know, when it gets that high, I, you know, I don't know. But listen, these people... They do. They fight dirty. That's what the mafia does. And listen, I'm going to get into the Bible here in a little bit. Uh, I'm just I'm using all this kind of for illustration to set up. But they do. They they fight dirty. And so you know the Bible teaches Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. And God's He's given us the Word of God that everyone is supposed to submit to, including the pastor. But that's not what we have today. People aren't. They're not being encouraged to go read their Bibles. They're being encouraged to just submit and follow what these people teach. And so they do. They, they fight dirty. They will stoop to extremely low levels. They will use your family against you. They will, they will use your family. They will find the scumbags to do their dirty work for them. You know, they're not, they're not even embarrassed calling in somebody like Sam Gipp 
and, and Bill Grady and these people and have them just preach garbage. They, they'll, they'll pick the worst of the worst in the Baptist world and they're using them to fight their battles for them. Why? Just because they're scared. They're, they're cowards themselves. So their goal, it's intimidation. And so once again, that's how it is now. People who know me, people who know me, they know I'm not crazy. They know I, I am an extremely nice person. I, I get along with people great. I don't tell all my friends, hey man, I love you even though you're pre-trip. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't throw the disclaimers out there. Okay, I'm not worried about who, you know, I, I mean, I want to have a good testimony, but listen, you know, I'm probably too loose with who I fellowship with and who I associate with. I just, I like people. If you've got salvation right and you're getting people saved, I'll be your friend because there is no post-trib mafia yet. Now we could end up getting one if we're not careful and I hope we don't ever do that, but you know, I don't care. I've had... Since I've been post-trib, I've had pre-trib preachers preach for me. And I'm not embarrassed by that. I don't put a disclaimer when I put their videos online. Now, I know this person's pre-trib, but they got salvation, right? You know, I, I, don't, I don't do any of that because I'm afraid my post-trib friends are going to get mad at me. I don't care. That's, that's, that's not that important. But yet these people have to do it all the time. And it's amazing too, you know, most of the guys that I've been friends with now, man, it's like I don't exist anymore. I vanish off the face of the earth. It's like, you, you people know I'm not crazy. You know I'm a nice guy. I've talked to you before and I've showed you from the scripture what I believe and you didn't even try to refute it. And yet now, listen, if somebody gets, the, if one of my friends completely gets the better of me on the subject, I'm going to want to go back and study it and I'm going to want to go back and have round two. But they don't want to do that. Either they're giving up after the first conversation or they're scared to be seen with me. They're scared to be associated with me. Why? Because they know. They know they're in the organization. They know the big boss is going to find out if he, that he's been running with me and being friends with me. And they're going to be in trouble. And listen, Baptists are... You know, so, you know, this is my question. Why is it that people are more scared to be associated with someone who's different on end times than someone who's different on salvation? Because, you know, some of these people, too, I'll talk to them about, like, you know, we're on the same page with salvation. And I'll talk about, you know, the three gospel crowd and the dispensational salvation crowd. Oh, I don't believe in that. Oh, no, that's, you know, that's heresy. That's garbage. I would never say Jesus is not my Messiah or he's not anyone's Messiah. I would, I would never say something like that. But yet they're not scared to associate with Sam Gipp. I mean, you got these guys, they're scared to death to like one of my wife's tweets, but they'll like Sam Gipp's tweet where he's talking about people being pornographers that are not pornographers. You know, they'll like somebody's tweet when they're saying they hope Pastor Anderson goes to the tribulation. I mean, they'll, they'll like the, I mean, what was some of those ones Sam Gipp was tweeting the other day? He just like went crazy. He was just like tweeting all kinds of just off the wall stuff just hurling accusations, hoping something would stick. And ding-dongs out there are liking that stuff. Because it doesn't matter that a man's a raving lunatic, probably has a brain tumor or something right now, and is absolutely going crazy. They'll like that stuff because even though he's a wacko psycho lying through his teeth that you can easily prove, he's pre-trib, and there's no consequence in the mafia of being associated with him. But my little wife that, you know, is just a woman... You know, they're terrified. You know, they, it's like they would like her tweets about salvation if they could put a disclaimer on the like. You know, I agree with this part about salvation, even though I don't agree with what she believes about end times. You know, and listen, I said, I like people, but you know what? If you're going to be that way, if you're going to be that scared of people, you know, don't worry about being my friend. I don't need to be surrounded by cowards. I would hate for it to rub off on me. I, I, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to be pansy. I don't want to. I don't, I don't want to be like that. But you know, John chapter 12, verse 42 says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, and, and also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Y'all see that? There's people, they knew Jesus telling the truth, but they kept their mouth shut, didn't they? Because they loved the praise of men. They didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. They were a bunch of cowards. What a shame that is. And Baptists are as bold as all get out when it comes to things that are politically correct. 
But they cower in a corner when it comes to things that are biblically correct. And, you know, I, um, I just saw uh, one evangelist, Dwight Smith, I actually surrendered to preach when he was preaching at Camp Joy. And I saw he had put, did a tweet. I agreed with this tweet 100%. Absolutely agree with this tweet. He said, I'm for the public execution and death penalty of all Islamic terrorists, Mr. President. Good. I agree. I'm for that too. And But then, here's the thing. But I'm also for the death penalty for murderers. I'm the de- for the death penalty of all rapists. I'm in the I'm for the death penalty of all pedophiles, and I'm in, I'm for the death penalty of all homosexuals. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa! Wait a minute! Now you're making Christians look bad. But well, wait a minute! The, where do we get the idea that it's okay to put murderers to death? We get that from the Bible, don't we? Well, where do we get the idea that it's okay to put homosexuals to death? Hey, not us, the government. Got to always throw that out there for the people out there who accuse us of trying to, you know, go killing people. But let, we get that from the Bible, the same place. So why is it that so many preachers are totally bold? Yes, death to Islamic terrorists. Why is it that when Trump drops a bomb on a bunch of terrorists and kills them, everybody's celebrating, everybody's cheering, everybody's tweeting, good job, Mr. President. But if a bunch of perverts get killed and somebody says something positive about that, all the Christians want to throw them under the bus. Well, that's not very Christ-like. Well, you know what's funny? When Dwight Smith tweeted that, you know what one of the replies he got? And you call yourself a Christian. Maybe don't advertise that. You're part of the problem. Okay, now obviously the person that tweeted that at him was an idiot. Okay? Saying you're not a very good Christian because you're for the death penalty for terrorists? All right, now... But at the same time, so what about the people who say that exact same thing to someone who is for the death penalty of homosexuality? You know what's funny? I don't know who that guy was that said that to him, but he was probably some atheist. But you know who would say that to guys like Pastor Jimenez when he got in trouble for saying what he said? They would say the exact same thing that that doofus said. You know why? Because Baptists are bold when it comes to things that are politically correct, but they are not bold when it comes to things that are biblically correct or politically incorrect and biblically correct. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. So how do we handle this crowd? Because sadly, too, and many people are, are sitting in churches where they got to put up with this stuff. A lot of the people that I talked to that were at this conference, they were worried about what was going to happen when they got back home because people, you know, they're... They're not causing trouble in their church like everybody likes to try to report. They're faithful. They tithe. They soul win. But they're honest with their pastor. They let them know what they believe about these things. And people know, and a lot of them were just afraid that it was going to get ugly. Because what happens too, and we, in many cases, the pastor a lot of times doesn't have a huge problem with these people. Because he knows them. Hey, these are good people. They're soul winners. They're faithful church members. But then one of the popes come along and tells them, hey, we're having a problem with these Andersonites. You have any of them in your church? Man, you better get rid of them. Oh, why, why do I need to get rid of them? Because they're trouble. They do this. They do that. And that pastor, he's too dumb to realize that, you know what? I actually know these people personally. I've actually seen how they are. And what do they do? They go and they listen to a guy who does not know those people. Somebody who's just, you know, got a vendetta against Pastor Anderson because he made him look like an idiot by refuting one of their messages they preach. And so how do we handle these people? All right, so now is where we're getting to the Bible. But first, we remember that they are not firing real bullets at us, only fiery darts. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16 says, Above all, taking the shield of faith... Whereby, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all of the fiery darts, not of the devil, people like the fiery darts of the devil. No, the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the shield of faith. What does that mean? That means whenever you do, whenever you read the Bible and you see what it says and you take it for exactly what it says and then some preacher gets up there and he starts just throwing things at you and he's calling you names, you know what you got to do? It, it hurts getting called the names. It gets hurt. It hurts getting called a heretic sometimes. But you know what you got to do? You got to hide behind the shield of faith. You got to say, you know, I know what the Bible says. I know what's so clear in the scriptures. And by faith, you just got to believe what you're reading in the Bible. And listen, that goes for any of you in here. 
I don't care what it is, whether it be end times doctrine, salvation issues, whether it's about standard separation, anything I preach, anything that, or anything that you believe, anything you stand for, it needs to be because you believe God's word. Not just because you've been intimidated into doing this, because you, you just want to get along with everybody here. You don't want me preaching at you. You need to make sure you do that because what if one of these days I'm trying to intimidate you with something that's false doctrine? That's going to hurt. And you need to know how to go to the Scriptures and hide behind what the Bible says and get behind that shield of faith. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Above all. It names all those things. But listen, you've got to be able to... If, if you just have offensive weapons... You're, all, you're only going to be able to survive so long. When the enemy's throwing things at you, you've got to have something to block it with. You've got to be able to quench those fiery darts of the wicked. And so we need to understand, while they can hurl the insults, while they can throw you out of their church, while they can take, you know, take these preachers' miss, um, missions away from them and ministries away from them, you need to understand that those are only fiery darts and we can quench them with the Word of God. These aren't real bullets. You're not going to get killed. Nobody's going to get killed by the pre-trib mafia, except for maybe me, uh, after this message. Nobody's going to get killed, okay? But you can get hurt if you don't get behind that shield of faith. Because it does. When you hear some of these people, man, you know, I got all these people calling me a heretic. Sometimes you start wondering if you are a heretic. When I was interviewing Pastor Boyle there, wait, wait do you see that interview? It's great. He got hammered by the pre-trib mafia. And he's like, when you have all these people calling you a heretic, you start to wonder if you are a heretic. It's like Beaver Cleaver once said, when he was in school, the kids were all telling me he drank gutter water. He's like, but I don't drink gutter water. But the kids told me I drank gutter water so much, my stomach started to feel like I had drunk gutter water. <laughs> and, and, it, and if you're not careful, if you get called that enough times, you'll start to think it, but not if you stay in the Bible. Not if you get that shield of faith and say, you know what, I don't care what they say. I see what the Bible says. And so... You know, go ahead, throw it all you want. You know, and it's like these people, you need to hide behind the scriptures while they're throwing these darts of Darby and Schofield and Larkin and Ruckman and all these things. They're throwing all these things at you and you, you got to hide behind the scriptures. And you know what? Larkin will never defeat the word of God. Schofield will never defeat the word of God. None of those guys will ever defeat the word of God. And so you need to also, you need to remember that you are an independent Baptist. And we believe in the priesthood of the believer. Look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 5. Let me turn over there real quick. We are, we are independent Baptists. We believe in the priesthood of a believer. Jesus Christ, He is our advocate. There is the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And then, but there's, there are pastors on a church. But you know what? Sometimes people take that role of pastor and they make it into more than what God made it into. And look what it says in verse 1. It says, The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also partake of the glory that shall be revealed. Here's your job. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore unto the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. A lot of people, they do, they take that role of the pastor and make it like king. I've heard preachers say that the pastor, in, in the household structure... Children are under the parents, you know, wife's under the husband, and the husband is under the pastor. The home structure and the church structure are two different things. I am not the authority of anyone's home other than my own. Okay? Now, I might be the pastor of this church, but the church is it's a separate structure. Okay? That's just, that's ridiculous to teach that. And you need to understand that you, each one of you in here, are accountable to God. You are accountable to God. There is only one mediator between God and man. And it's not your pastor. Okay? You know, don't let um, um, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. This, is an, this verse often gets misused. Um, 
obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. Okay. Obey them that have the rule over you. Now, once again, all right, just because I'm the pastor in this church and God has made me, you know, the overseer of this church, does that give me right to go into your home and rule over you? No, God did not give me rule over you in your home. Okay, now within the church, you know, God, you know, the, the pastor isn't an authority there, but that, that's a separate thing. But we've got these people that are coming along and trying to force people what to do. You know, I can't force you into believing anything. Okay? And as far as we're going to push it here when it comes to the post trip, if you don't believe post trip like we teach here, you're not going to get thrown out of the church. I'm not going to come into your house and tell you what to do. As far as it will go, I will probably tell you, you know, if you teach a class or you preach, you know, you can't preach pre-trib here. But if you go home and you preach it to your kids, I, I've got nothing to say about that. Okay, but I can tell you not to preach it here, but that's as far as that goes. And you've got these preachers today. I mean, it's like they're trying to find an enforcement method so they can make sure people aren't watching, you know, Pastor Anderson videos on YouTube. You know, it's like, you know, we got to run your internet through a filter, you know, uh, our, one of our church filters, and they're going to block all his stuff if they could get it. They, and you know what? Some pastors would do that if they could get away with it. They absolutely would do that. If the technology ever comes, they could set something in the church and make it where all your computer stuff runs through that. They will filter that stuff out for you. You can do that yourself. Okay? If you don't, if you shouldn't be watching that stuff, you know, that's up to you to not do it. I'm, I am not going into anybody's house and installing filters on their computers and blocking channels with where only I have the password. And listen, and some pastors will do that for people. Okay, not me. Okay, if you can't handle what you watch on your television, then you just need to throw it out. I'm not coming and babysitting you on that stuff. I got enough work taking care of my own family that and I'm I'm not going to do that. And so you need to remember. These people, they're not firing real bullets, only fiery darts. We can block those with the shield of faith. You know, we are an, you are an independent Baptist. We believe in the priesthood of the believer. You are accountable to God. And I'm going to show you another verse on that here in a little bit. Uh, go ahead and turn over to Romans chapter 14. And so you need to understand, if you do what they tell you to do, when they haven't convinced you, and listen, this doesn't just apply to pre-trip. This is anything I preach. Okay? If you do... Anything that I'm telling you to do when I haven't even convinced you of it, do you realize you're still sinning? Let's read, let's look at some verses in Romans chapter 14, and we'll start reading in verse 1. This is this is very important here. This is what I really want you to get. Because I said this this pre-trip, intimidation is all they're using. They can't use scripture, they don't have any. They don't have any clear scripture. They can only use other books, they can only use dispensationalism. They can only use college textbooks. They can't use Bible. But look what it says in verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand." One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Okay, some people when it comes to food, all right, if somebody gets saved out of Hinduism, they might be a little nervous about eating meat or out of Judaism. They might be a little nervous about eating bacon. Okay, we don't need to force that down their throat, even though we know it's fine to eat bacon and thank God for that. Okay, we don't need to force it down their throat. You know why? Because if they're not sure it's right, they shouldn't eat it. They should not eat until they've been fully persuaded in their own mind. They don't, they should not, they should not do that. They should not just go ahead and eat whatever just because Pastor Tommy said it's okay to eat whatever. They need to go to the scriptures. They need to pray about it. They need to be fully persuaded in their own mind. And then verse six. Um, he that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day of the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. 
For whether we live, we live under the Lord. Whether we die, we die under the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For as it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Y'all see that? You are going to give an account of yourself when you stand before God. Of yourself. I'm not going to be standing there with you. Nobody else is going to be standing there with you. Your Baptist Pope, if you have one, is not going to be standing there with you. You are accountable to yourself. It's between you and God. And you better make sure whatever you're doing in your life, you're doing it because I know this is what God wants me to do. Because what if I am a false prophet? What I mean, you know, what if the next church you go to, it's a false prophet? How you get, you know, you've got to make sure you're doing the right thing because you are accountable to God for what you do. And so since you're accountable to God, are you going to be foolish enough to just go along with what I say? When you're not accountable to me, you're accountable to God. You better make sure you're doing the right thing. You better make sure that your doctrine is right. Don't just let me, don't, don't let me off so easy that all I've got to do is get up and scream at you for 45 minutes and then boom, you're in line. Make me prove it from the scriptures. If you do that, it's going to be harder for me to start preaching false doctrine. But we've got these massive churches where people are just all in line, going along with the preacher, and he doesn't have to use scripture. These people just do what he says. And you know what? It's fine in certain areas because a lot of times the pastor's right on certain areas, but sometimes he's dead wrong. And these people are going to give an account of themselves. And they're not, and when you stand there before God, you, when you're there with your knee bowed before him, you're not going to be able to say, my pastor, well, what? You're accountable to me. I gave you my word. You had a Bible. You were supposed to read it. You just went off what your pastor said. Even though the Bible, I wrote it right here. This is, this is the truth. And you ignored it just because of that. Listen, you can't afford to do that. You can't afford, it's foolish. It's way too much of a gamble to just listen to everything I say and run with it. I'd like to think you'll do great if you do. And if I'm preaching the truth, you will do great. But what if I'm not? Don't take that chance. You better be fully persuaded in your own mind because every one of us are going to give an account of himself to God. Jump down to verse 22. Look at this. It says here, it says, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So that person that's eating the bacon because the Baptist preacher told him, hey, it's okay for you to eat bacon. When they're not sure, the Bible says, you're in trouble. You're damned if you eat because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Well, what's something of faith? Well, I've got faith in my pastor. Is that what that's talking about? No, you got to have faith in God. You have to have faith in his word. And if you are just doing something and believing something just because I told you, maybe you've got doubts in your mind. I don't, I don't know. I, I think he's pushing this too far. Uh, you know, but you know what? I don't want to get him mad at me. You know, we need to go along just to get along. No, don't ever do that. If you're not doing it by faith, it's still sin. Even if what I'm telling you to do is true, if you have doubt in your mind, if you're not sure what you're doing is still sin, the Bible says. So it's not even doing you any good. And so we see that once again, this is why intimidation, it's a horrible tactic. It's not going to help anybody because if we're just using intimidation, I told a preacher one time, it's like he was trying to intimidate me and to quit preaching these things. And I told him, I said, listen, you haven't given me one biblical reason. You haven't even tried to open the scriptures and show me where I'm wrong. You're telling me not to preach what I am convinced of from the scriptures because you're telling me I'm wrong. And I said, you can't expect me to do that. And you know, it's, he's, you know he, and he told me, he said, no, I wouldn't expect you to do that. And I was glad he said that. But you know, I think some preachers, they'd be okay with that. And look, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want you all in here. 
I don't want you to go out soul winning thinking, well, Pastor Tommy says it's something Christians ought to do. He says it's something to work. I don't really think it works, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it together. No, don't, don't do that. Don't, you, know, you, need to, you need to figure it out. You need to be convinced from the Scriptures. You need to find out what the truth is. And so if you're in doubt about something that's be, being preached, you need to do four things real quickly. Is First, make sure you're just not in the flesh and being stubborn. Okay? And don't take this all good. I don't have to listen to anything Brother Tommy preaches anymore unless I'm fully persuaded in my own mind. And then every time I preach something uncomfortable, yeah, I'm not convinced. I'm going to go along my merry way, okay? All right, you got, you got to be honest with yourself, okay? You got to be honest with yourself and make sure you're not just in the flesh and being stubborn, okay? Some things in the Bible are really clear. All right? They're really clear, and people, if you don't get it, it's because you don't want to get it. All right, but either way... Be honest, Proverbs 29, 1 says, He that being often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. Okay? So, just, you know, and I'm ta- write these four things down. Anything I preach, you should not follow until you've been fully persuaded in your own mind, but make sure, make sure you're not just in the flesh and being stubborn. Okay? Because that is, that's an easy thing to do. But then secondly, commit to God that you will follow the truth wherever it leads. Okay? And listen, don't pray this. Don't commit it, something to God and then not follow through. That's what I had to do in these end times things. When I finally realized that you know I might be wrong on this and I wanted to know the truth, I prayed and I did. I, I promised the Lord. I said, Lord, I will take this wherever it leads. I, I'll, whatever, whatever you convince me of from the scriptures, I will preach that even if it means I lose church people, even if it means I lose friends. I, I committed to that. And, and it was after that when things started becoming clear to me. I think God, God believed me. So if you do, commit to God. You'll follow the truth wherever it leads, and then you better do it. If you don't think you can do that, don't make the promise. Okay, You're better off not making a vow than vowing it, not paying it. But if you really want to know the truth, I believe if you'll do that, the Lord's going to show you. You better watch out. He just may rock your world. You better, you better watch it if you do that. But then finally, you've got to get into the book. Okay? Don't just say, well, I want the Lord to teach me. If the Lord teach me, and then not read your Bible. Okay? You've got to actually study it. Okay? You're, going to, you're actually going to have to do some work. You're going to have to actually labor in the Word yourself. We are supposed to read the Bible. So you don't just think, well, wherever the Lord leads, I'm going to go. And so that means if the pastor preaches on it, that subject, you know, listen, I, I might miss that subject for a long time. You need to get in the Bible yourself. You need to study it yourself. And then, until you've been fully persuaded, don't run your mouth. Okay? Don't run your mouth. When you start running your mouth on something before you're ready, then it's going to be easy for pride to set in and for pride to get in the way. And you're not going to want to change if you find out you've been, you've been wrong on something. But you do. You need to, you know, before you start changing things, before you go tell your you know, husbands, before you go tell your wife, hey, we're changing this in our family, wait until you've been fully persuaded in your own mind. Because if you do, if you're like, all right, honey, we're changing this, and then two weeks later, he's like, yeah, that was stupid. Well, then next time something comes along where you're going to make a change, really? You know, you're... You're really going to make me throw out all these, you know, all this clothes that I wear, you know, and then does this mean we're going to have to buy it, you know, a month later like we did last time? You know, that happens in homes all the time. You know, don't do that. Okay. Wait until you've been fully convinced. And then because once again, whatsoever is not a faith is sin. So it's got to be a faith. So sadly, Christians today, they're just, they're stubborn. They're set in their ways probably more than ever. While at the same time, Christians, they're so stubborn, they're set in their ways, while more biblically illiterate than ever before. It's it's crazy. And the only way that could even make sense to be so set in your ways when you know so little about the Bible is if church and religion is nothing more than a social club. I got to keep my friends happy. I got to keep my fellow church members happy. You know, and many Christians today, they just rather go along to get along. But that's not what we've been called to do. And you know, we should earnestly contend for the faith, and things are only going to get worse in this world. They're going to keep on getting worse. Crazier and crazier doctrines are going to keep coming in, 
And listen, we need guys, people, to say enough's enough. We have got to start rejecting false doctrine, even if it costs us something. And so that is how we handle the pre, you handle the pre-trib mafia. And not just the pre-trib mafia. Even here, I don't ever want our church to turn into a mafia. I don't want to have a mafia organization within our church. I don't want to become a part of another mafia organization. I don't ever want to use intimidation as a method of changing people's minds. Because you know what? You're not changing their mind. That's, they're not fully persuading their mind. They might be doing what I want them to do, but they're not doing it in faith, and therefore, it's still sin. And so, I, I'm serious. I do. I believe in the post-trib doctrine. I reject Zionism. But you know what? We won't throw you out of this church if you don't agree with us on that. If I find out that you went to a pre-trib conference, I'm not going to throw you out of the church. Okay? We're not going to let you get up and preach what you learned at that thing there. You know, th- those are not salvation issues. Okay? I- I'm not going to do that. I- but you know what? I don't want you to change to this position until I have convinced you. Until you've been fully persuaded in your own mind. And that goes for anything I preach. Don't go changing your life and turning your life upside down because of something I preached just because I said it. Let it be because it's what the Word of God says and you know how to prove it and you know how to show it because what are you going to do? Okay, Husbands, if you start making your wives dress like a lady, okay, what are you going to do when they start getting criticized by the other family members, by their friends? Oh, well, our pastor says, well, guess what? They're going to say, well, our pastor's wife, you know, she does, you know, our pastor's wife does this, or our pastor says, you can't win the argument that way. You know what you have to be able to do? You've got to be able to open up a Bible. And understand, even when you open the Bible and you show them verses like, a woman should not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment for all that do so are an abomination. Even when you show them something that clear, do you realize they're still not going to be like, oh, man. You're right. All right, let's throw all those. You know, let's. Th- you know, they're not going to do that. So then, you know what you're. You know what they're going to do? They're going to throw fiery darts at you. And so, guess what? You now have to. You got to get behind that shield of faith and say, you know what? I know what the Bible says. I'm following the leading of the Holy Spirit. I'm following the Word of God. And if you just change those things because I told you to, your family is going to change your mind right back, and then you're going to look like an idiot. And so you need to understand how important it is in all subjects to be fully persuaded. You are going to stand as an individual before Jesus Christ one of these days, and you're going to give an account of yourself. And are you going to let, don't ever let any preacher, including myself, get you in a whole bunch of trouble. You need to, you need to do what you do because you're convinced that's what the Bible teaches. And so with that, let's all stand